Bless you, and good afternoon. Okay, just have one thing at the top to get us started. Uh, President Biden has made clear that the United States is prepared to provide any and all types of aid to the people of Turkey and Syria in response to the ongoing humanitarian crisis there, and we continue to take steps to do so. I'm sure you all saw during the Super Bowl, to, during the Super Bowl yesterday, to donate to Earth quake relief efforts, and I want to point out some resources just for that. There's a page on USA AIDS uh, has a list where they have a list of vetted organizations responding to this crisis should individuals want to contribute. You can find that at CIDI.org. In Turkey, our urban search and rescue teams continue their efforts assisting in live rescues over the weekend. We also continue to support the Turkish teams on the ground. U.S. military helicopters are providing critical lift for U.S. and international responders. Our teams also continue to conduct structural damage assessments of buildings with the hope of being able to clear as many as possible. To date, they have assessed more than 5,500 buildings, allowing thousands of people who are currently displaced to be able to return home. In Syria, cross-border aid shipments have increased. Yesterday, a fourth UN convoy of 10 trucks from a US-supported humanitarian partner successfully crossed into Syria from Turkey. That brings the total to 52 UN trucks, but more needs to be done. It's critical for the Security Council to authorize two additional crossings to help deliver life-saving assistance. We cannot delay any longer. Again, I want to emphasize that any U.S. or international sanctions include exemptions for humanitarian, medical food, and other aid. And one last thing before I turn it over to the Admiral, I just wanted to make sure we address this from the White House. I know there have been questions and, and concerns about this, but there is no, again, no indication of aliens or extraterrestrial activity <laughs> with these recent takedowns. Again, there is no indication of aliens or terrestrial activity with these recent and takedowns. Wanted to make sure that the American people knew that, all of you knew that, uh, and it was important for us to say that from here because we've been hearing a lot about it. Um, I, I, I'm not... I, I'm just, you know, I loved E.T., the movie, but I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. Um, with that, with all seriousness, I know there is a lot of questions about uh, the uh, flying objects. Admiral John Kirby is here with us today, and he's going to have a, a topper, a couple things to say at the top about it, and then take your questions, okay? 
Thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> <laughs> it makes my job easy. I, I do have uh, quite a few comments here at the top, so I, I do uh, hope that you'll just uh, bear with me and then be happy to take whatever questions you, uh, you might have. So uh, I'd like to begin today by updating you on our efforts to recover the debris of several objects that the United States Air Force shot down over the last few days, as well as that of the spy balloon belonging to the People's Republic of China. And I'd like to put into some context for you how we have worked and are still working to better understand the issue of high-altitude, low-speed craft. Now, let me start with the Chinese program. When President Biden came into office, he directed the U.S. intelligence community to do a broad assessment of Chinese intelligence capabilities and to assure and to ensure that we were working to detect and to protect against them. I think for reasons that you will all understand, we cannot publicly go into many details about how we discover uh, and counteract foreign intelligence collection efforts, because much of what we have done and are doing is, of course, sensitive. But we were able to determine that China has a high-altitude balloon program for intelligence collection that's connected to the People's Liberation Army. It was operating during the previous administration, but they did not detect it. We detected it. We tracked it. And we have been carefully studying it to learn as much as we can. We know that these PRC surveillance balloons have crossed over dozens of countries on multiple continents around the world, including some of our closest allies and partners. We assessed that at this time, these balloons have provided limited additive capabilities to the PRC's other intelligence platforms used over the United States. But in the future, if the PRC continues to advance this technology, it certainly could become more valuable to them. The President also instructed the intelligence community to take a broad look at the phenomenon of unidentified aerial objects. Indeed, President Biden conducted the first ever daily intelligence briefing session devoted to this phenomenon back in June. 2021. He was briefed that this is not just an issue for the United States, but one for the rest of the world. And as I said, our friends and our partners are dealing with this as well. We worked on a bipartisan basis to stand up an office at the Pentagon to study this in partnership with the intelligence community, academic institutions, and the private sector. These unidentified aerial phenomena have been reported for many years without explanation or deep examination by the government. President Biden has changed all that. We are finally trying to understand them better. Now, in light of the Chinese balloon program and this recent incursion into our airspace, the United States and Canada, through NORAD, have been more closely scrutinizing that airspace, including enhancing our radar capabilities, which, as the commander of NORTHCOM and NORAD, General Van Herc, said just last night, may at least partially explain the increase in the objects that have been detected. Slow-moving objects at high altitude with a small radar cross-section are difficult to detect on radar. Even objects the size of a, the Chinese spy balloon, which had a payload the size of roughly three school buses, were not picked up by previous administrations or other countries. We also know that a range of entities, including countries, companies, research and academic organizations, operate objects at these altitudes for purposes that are not nefarious at all, including scientific research. That said, because we have not yet been able to defi definitively assess what these most recent objects are, we acted out of an abundance of caution to protect the security, our security, our interest, and flight safety. In Saturday's case, we acted in consultation with the Canadian government, the President speaking personally with, the, with Prime Minister Trudeau. The spy balloon was, of course, different because we knew precisely where that was. As we have said, we do not assess that these most recent objects posed any direct threat to people on the ground, and we are laser focused on confirming their nature and purpose, including through intensive efforts to collect debris in the remote locations where they have fallen. In each instance, we have followed the same basic course. We assessed whether they posed any kinetic threat to people on the ground. They did not. We assessed whether they were sending any communication signals. We detected none. We looked to see whether they were maneuvering or had any pr propulsion capabilities. We saw no signs of that. And we made sure to determine whether or not they were manned. 
They were not. We did, however, assess that their altitudes were considerably lower than the Chinese high altitude balloon and did pose a threat to civilians. I kind of covered that in the opening statement. Um, two real reasons here. First, there was a very real potential risk to civilian air traffic. The one shut down on Saturday, I'm sorry, uh, yesterday, uh, was about 20,000 feet. And the two shut down Friday and Saturday were at about 40,000 feet. And as you know, transcontinental air traffic is roughly around 30,000 feet. It depends, of course, on, on weather. And so uh, because we assessed that they weren't manned and weren't being controlled, uh, therefore left to atmospheric conditions, um, the, the real risk to safety of flight was, was a problem. The second purpose, and I talked about this earlier too, was even though we had no indications that any of these three objects were surveilling, we couldn't rule that out. And so there, you know, you, you want to err on the side of safety here in terms of protecting our national security interests and the fact that these objects uh, could have and, uh, and likely did at some point in their path uh, transit over, you know, potential military sites of ours or sensitive sites. Uh, so again, out of an abundance of caution for those two reasons, the president, with the recommendation of his military leaders, directed them to be taken down. Because it's so unprecedented, um, should the public be hearing from the president directly on this? I have, we have been, uh, uh, I think, as transparent as we can be. I, I won't speak for the president's uh, uh, personal uh, speaking schedule, but, I mean, he has been deeply engaged in uh, every one of these decisions. He's been kept informed, including as of this morning, on uh, what's going on with recovery efforts. Um, and uh, and uh, he's very much staying on top of the issue and, uh, and directing his team to make sure we are properly consulting and briefing not just members of Congress, but state leaders as well. And of course, you know, we're also doing what we can in the, in the public sphere. Can you get the European countries? Oh, wait a second, Brian. sir. Excuse me. Thank you, John. What is the president's standard going to be going forward about when he orders an unidentified object shot down? It's, it comes down to one simple formulation, and that's if at the recommendation of his military leaders he believes that the safety and security of the United States, that the safety and security of the American people, his prime responsibility, warrant that kind of a decision. So it's possible we could see these shoot downs on a regular basis like we saw over the weekend? I don't think it's useful for me to get ahead of where we are right now. The president will always side on preserving and protecting the safety and security of the American people. You said we're not flying any surveillance balloons over China. Are we flying any other kind of surveillance craft routinely over China? We are not flying surveillance balloons over China. I'm not aware of any other craft that we're flying over uh, in, into Chinese airspace. And then finally, can you tell us anything more about this octagonal object? How big was it? We're still trying to assess uh, what what that was. I, I'm not going to get into a description. I've, I've seen the press reports about what, what it looked like. Um, I, I think we all need to be humble here in, in terms of what our ability is to positively identify stuff from fighter aircraft that are going several hundred miles an hour past essentially, in terms of relative motion, a stationary object um, that was not very big. Um, so we don't know what this exactly looked like. And again, we're still not sure exactly what, what, it, what the purpose of it was or who owned it. But we, we hope to be able to find out more once we can recover the debris from that one and from the other two as well. Um, just a few minutes ago, Prime Minister Trudeau said that there's some sort of pattern to the objects over the last few days. Is that something you could elaborate on, what sort of pattern the White House has seen? I'm not familiar with the Prime Minister's comments, so I, I don't know if I, uh, if I should uh, take a, a swing at that. I, I would just tell you that, going back to what I said before, uh, these objects were not being maneuvered. They did not appear to have any self-propulsion. So the likely hypothesis is that they were being moved by the prevailing winds. Um, and maybe perhaps that's what the, the Prime Minister is talking about. I don't want to speak for him. But uh, certainly, um, as the prevailing winds, particularly at that altitude, go west to east acro across the North American uh, airspace, I mean, there was a general common movement in, in that regard. You, you spoke at the top about kind of reassessing radar, given what happened with, with the initial balloon. Can you give us a sense 
Can we expect, uh, should we assume that this is the, the regular number of these objects over the United States, that they've always been there and they just haven't been um, looked at the same way? Or is there any reason to expect that this is this I, is more I, than usual that, that are flying? Over so two thoughts there. I mean, I, I think um, I, I think we can all get our heads around the fact that, um, that uh, there are sometimes uh, things floating at high altitudes for various purposes. As I said, scientific research, weather, weather balloons, uh, all manner of, uh, of, uh, of innocuous craft uh, uh, can, can be aloft at high altitudes. I don't think that that's necessarily un unusual here. Um, it's difficult for, for me to say exactly what you can expect going forward. One of the reasons that we think we're seeing more is because we're looking for more. As you heard uh, General Van Herc mention last night, they have, uh, they have modified the filters and the gains, as we call it, uh, of, the, of the, the radar capabilities to look more discreetly at high altitude, small radar cross section, and low speed objects. And so if you do that, um, Anybody that's operated a radar will know you can set you can set the parameters, and if you set the parameters in such a way that to look for a certain something, it's more likely that you're going to find a certain something. Okay. Uh, given all you've discussed here and the actions the administration is taking, and what people have learned, Chinese spy balloon this year and previous years, these unidentified objects that we shoot down, uh, they might have a question. Uh, when it comes to these higher altitudes, are America's borders secure? The president uh, takes, uh, as I said earlier, he takes uh, our national security uh, extremely seriously. He has no higher responsibility than the safety and security of the American people. And I don't think you need to look any further, quite frankly, than the decisions he's made in just the last week to 10 days uh, to evidence that. But it feels like he's plugging holes, like these are vulnerabilities that we are discovering in real time. You're making an assumption there that I don't know that the, I don't know that the analysis will actually bear out. Much. Um, the president gave the order to shoot down the object over Lake Huron yesterday. Where was he? What kind of information did he have when he gave that order? What was briefed to him? And, and what, how did he anticipate the outcome of that? He was here in the White House. He was uh, kept constantly informed by, uh, by his national security team and certainly by the military. Um, uh, he made that decision. I, I don't, couldn't give you the exact time on the clock, but it was, uh, uh, I believe, uh, mid to late morning, um, and, uh, and then it was executed in the, in the afternoon. Were, were there contingencies in place in case there was a reaction from a foreign government in reaction to shooting that object down? Was the, the one, on, the one yesterday? The one yesterday, yeah. Well, it was shot over, I mean, it was shot over Lake Huron and landed in what we believe to be the Canadian side of the lake. Um, so we were obviously in constant communication and consultation with our Canadian counterparts, and they are rightly, because of where we think it splashed down, I mean, they're sort of the, in concert with the U.S. Coast Guard, but they are also involved in, in trying to locate the, the debris right now. But there was good communication with our Canadian yeah, allies. Signs of a foreign government taking a special interest in that object from yesterday no. or reacting in an unusual way? No. Good. I see you in the back. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, John. Two questions. One, you mentioned early on that um, this the, the China uh, balloon might have been giving limited additive capabilities. I assume you're um, meaning onto their satellite surveillance. Can you specify what, I mean, what exactly it's getting from a balloon that they're not getting from orb orbiting satellites that go over us like dozens of With the caveat down. that we haven't fully recovered everything, though we have recovered some things from the bottom of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the Atlantic, um, and we're analyzing that. But with that caveat that we don't know exactly uh, what this uh, balloon uh, was surveilling or what its capabilities were. So just in general, and I, that is an important caveat that I'd like you to remember. Um, when you are at a lower altitude than space, um, you could perhaps get a better fidelity uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of imagery, for instance, uh, uh, of things on the ground. Uh, when you are not moving at the speed of a satellite, and therefore, you know, only getting seconds over a, a, a site when you can maneuver left, right, slow down, speed up like this thing could, then you can loiter. If you can loiter, 
you can soak in a little bit more. You can spend more time over a, a sensitive site. But, uh, some of their satellites are in geostationary orbit. I mean, they're just sitting there <coughs> gathering signals intelligence, right? So. Um, what is the benefit? I mean, is it just to see what kind of fidelity? We're going to learn more. I'd rather not go into any more detail than that right now. We're going to learn more. Um, and frankly, I think that's a terrific question you should be asking Beijing. And, and one last one. Uh, the, um, you said that uh, the, four, the other objects shot down were not able to transmit or were not transmitting signals, that they did not have any propulsion. Did the China balloon, did that have any, um, was it emitting signals back? I'm not going to go into more detail about uh, uh, the capabilities of that. We are going to be studying it and analyzing it. There is no question in our minds that that system was designed to surveil, that that was an intelligence asset. I'll leave it there. Has there been any outreach from anywhere in the administration to the kinds of companies that produce weather balloons or other craft that would fit these descriptions that might be from the commercial or corporate world to say, is this yours, or any kind of outreach, or have you been hearing from anyone who might say, we have ours, they're in this area. Is any of that going on now? I, I don't know of any conversations right now, uh, uh, Kelly, but one of the reasons why the President directed Mr. Sullivan to put together an interagency effort is to take a long look at that and try to learn a little bit better about who is up at that altitude doing what uh, for completely legitimate purposes. I think we, we all recognize we need to probably have a better site picture on that, and that's why the President wants this interagency effort to take a look. And what kind of intelligence might be happening in terms of the diplomacy that's going on or whatever if these are state-owned uh, objects? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Uh, is, there, is there a network of conversations that might be happening where someone might be able to say, based on this Octag octagonal description that, hey, that sounds like the so-and-so. I mean, is there some conversations that are happening that might be able to give us some descriptions? I mean, the short answer to your question is yes, and I talked about that in my opening statement. Uh, the President also directed Secretary Blinken, Secretary Austin, uh, Director Haynes uh, to have these kinds of conversations with our allies and partners around the world to share with them what we're learning, but also to see get the, get their the perspectives. Chinese we're quick to say it's ours, but it was for commercial purposes. Yeah, I, again, we're going to have those kinds of conversations with our with our allies and partners to see what kind of experiences that they have had, what uh, what we can learn from from them, what perhaps they can learn from us. And are we still with object, or can we call them balloons? Still with object. And just to follow up on Kelly's question, and I won't mess that up today. <laughs> on, the, on the corporate angle, is there any expectation that this is going to affect the, the executive order on surveilling the U.S. companies and what they're doing in China and the, their I know operations there? I know no such there. to that executive order. Uh, okay. And then um, is there and just you said a moment ago that there's uh, no knowledge of a, a U.S. balloon or other craft over Chinese territory, just being cognizant of the fact that China has a different definition of what their territory is than the United States. Is there any U.S. surveillance aircraft over Taiwan, <laughs> over uh, the South China Sea that, that would, would fit into that? There is no U.S. surveillance uh, aircraft uh, over Chinese, uh, in Chinese airspace. Okay, even Chinese claimed airspace. There is no U.S. surveillance aircraft in Chinese airspace. Okay, and, then, and then just finally, is there any um, new formal approach that's being developed as far as how you're going to deal with these things on a systematic basis going forward? Is there a well, again, <laughs> again, that's what, that's exactly what the the President wants Mr. Sullivan to run as a process, an interagency process, to help us, as I said in my opening statement, get around the policy implications here, and whether and whether or not there needs to be any uh, policy changes going forward. Thanks, Sean. Um, no precedent for U.S. fighters taking down objects over U.S. territory, as far as I'm aware of. I guess my question is, you talked about the, the tweak in the radar systems. Has yeah. there been a tweak in the threshold for uh, the Pentagon? Uh, presenting to the President, the President signing off on military action related to anything over our airspace. I'm not sure I'm following what you In mean. In the wake the Chinese spy balloon, yeah. the radars were tweaked, which is why you think you're seeing some of these things. Right. Has the decision about, or has the threshold for the use of fighters to take down objects also been tweaked? Has it been lowered? Has it been changed? We've never seen this before. All of a sudden, we've seen three No, I, three actually, I, I'm sorry I didn't understand it at first. No, I mean, and you heard General Van Herc talk about this last night. 
and he's using established protocols um, to engage um, uh, craft in, in the air, aircraft in the air, um, that can be legitimately brought down. And as he said last night, the best way to do that, certainly in a timely and efficient, effective way, was through fighter aircraft and through the sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles. Um, and they looked at, and he talked about this, they looked at other options to try to bring them down uh, to include gunfire, but that would have presented um, a greater risk to the pilots themselves. So this was the safest, most effective way to do that. Now, where we go from here, I, I think we just don't know right now in terms of whether there needs to be threshold changes, as you put out. I, I think it's important to just take a step back here and, and, and remember what the president did was ordered these actions with the safety and security of the American people foremost in his mind. Um, and there were there were very good reasons to do it. Um, the military then, once given an order, determines how they're going to execute that order. Uh, General Van Herc decided that the best way to do this was with Sidewinder missiles and, and fighter aircraft. And just to quickly put a sharper point on it, this isn't reactive to the Chinese spy balloon in the sense of there was political pressure, and so we are going to act quickly to take down any objects over our airspace because of the pressure that came from, say, Republicans. This was, this was, these were decisions based uh, uh, purely and simply uh, on what was in the best interest of the American people. That's great. Thanks, John. Um, John, does the U.S. government have video or imagery of these latest intercepts, and will you guys be releasing it? You'd have to talk to DOD about that, Jackie. I, I, I don't know of what kind of imagery might exist, and uh, and they'd be one to, to talk about whether they're releasable or not. Um, obviously, certainly with respect to the spy balloon, there, um, we want to make sure that we are gleaning what we can from this Im imagery so that we can answer your questions better. Um, and so to what degree there is or will it, it will or will not be public release, I, I do want to stress that you know we're going to want to make sure that we have had a chance to analyze that imagery uh, for ourselves as, as much as possible. Following up on Phil's question, I, mean, I guess what we're trying to discern is you said earlier, you know, we're looking for these more, so we're finding more. And so I said that could be one reason why we're finding could more. Be one reason, but what we're getting at is, you know, why are we all of a sudden shooting them down? And to add to that, you know, the NORAD commander, for instance, said that uh, when the first spy balloon was crossing over American and then Canadian airspace, one of the reasons that he couldn't take action was because his assessment was that it didn't pose a military threat or have hostile intent, and so he couldn't take action there. It seems like maybe that protocol has changed, or his, his ability to make that call where there is not an imminent threat militarily um, or physically might have changed. So, so can you explain to us what changed? Why are we shooting them down all of a sudden? I kind of feel like I took care of that in my opening statement, but I'm happy to revisit it. I mean, really two reasons here. Uh, and these are in, certainly in, well, in both cases, they're, they're different. I mean, I think we need to separate the Chinese spy balloon. We knew what it was. We knew where it was going. We knew what it was trying to do. And by not taking it down, I mean, that was also a huge payload. Like I said, the size of three school buses. So really the option of shooting that down over land wasn't a legitimate option because somebody really could have gotten hurt. And we used the, the, the time available to us, knowing what this thing was all about. We used that time to study it, to learn from it, to collect on it, then taking it down at the earliest opportunity in the water. And we have retrieved some of that debris off the bottom, and we're studying that. Hang on a second. I'll be right there. Um, but So let's separate that from these other three. And these other three, what are some of the differences? Altitude's a big difference. The threshold now? A risk to no, civilian just, aircraft? Just, let's, let, me, let me get through this. And then altitude's different. The Chinese spy balloon was at 60,000 plus, well outside commercial air traffic uh, concerns. These three were right on the border of it. So there was a legitimate concern there. Chinese spy balloon, we knew exactly what that thing was. And we knew what it was trying to do. And we saw it, Jackie, as it slowed down, sped up, maneuvered a little bit, um, trying to get a look at what we believe to be sensitive military sites. These other three, they didn't have propulsion. They weren't being maneuvered. It was basically they were being, being driven uh, by, the, by the wind. We don't think, we don't, we don't 
know for sure whether they had a surveillance aspect to them, but we can't rule it out. So there was a little bit, there was enough uncertainty there uh, that, again, out of an abundance of caution, doing the prudent thing, the president directed that they get taken down. And I, I get where you're going. Is this the standard going forward? And we're going we're gonna to dive into this. We're going to learn from these three events. Um, we're going to continue to study what happened. We're going to have an interagency effort that helps us get around the policy implications here, and we'll see where this goes. But bottom line for President Biden is, you got to do the right thing for the American people, for our safety and security. Is it strange that no one's claimed these yet as theirs? Uh, I, I can't say whether that's strange or not, since we're sort of in uncharted territory here, uh, no pun intended, but we don't, you know, we don't, we don't know. Uh, and I suspect that... It, that wait, 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 it, wait, wait, wait. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm, I'm basically okay. done. Okay. I'm basically name, done. Sir? What's your name, sir? Oh, from CBS. Okay. Um, okay. Has the payload been recovered from South Carolina yet? The, the large so-called payload that's... Yeah, as I said, some of the debris, certainly uh, they were able to take things off the surface like the next day, actually that afternoon, uh, some of the balloon uh, fabric. Um, and in the days since, they have been able to recover some, not all, uh, of the payload that sank to the bottom of the Atlantic. It's in about 45 feet of water. Weather conditions are pretty tough off the coast right now. Like today, for instance, they have not been able to get into the water and dive on it. But over the course of the weekend, they were able to raise some of the debris, including uh, some of the electronics and, and, uh, uh, and some of the structure. Do you have an expectation of when all that payload is going to be collected? I don't. I, I wish I, if I, if I could tell you that, I, I'd be a very wealthy man. I mean, it's gonna, it could take, it could take a long time. Uh, given uh, sea, the sea state and weather conditions and the degree to which we have to protect the safety of the divers. And one last question. You said you were unsure of the surveillance capabilities of these latest objects. Um, last week we were told several times that every precaution was taken to ensure that the sensitive installations were covered. We don't know exactly what you all did. But has there been a Nor are you going to find out. <laughs> well, it, has there been a posture change nationwide uh, regarding all of these sensitive uh, sites. If Take you're it proactively, if you're, um, <clears throat> let me just put a fork in this. If this, if the, if the implication is that you know uh, there's some sort of blanket now security policy for every base on the continental United States, the answer is no. We do have protocols, particularly when we we know um, that um, surveillance is going to occur, like in. The Open Skies Treaty with Russia, for instance, uh, when all that's scheduled and laid out, and when you know that uh, there's going to be an Open Skies flight by, uh, by, by Russia, you, you take the appropriate actions. And uh, that's what we did um, in the case of the Chinese spy balloon, um, and we'll always do that. I will never talk about what precautions we're going to make at any given time. a lot to our ability to, to, track, to track, detect, and engage. Having come from the Pentagon, I can tell you that some of these UAPs, um, uh, while we may not be able to know what each and every one is doing, some of the big concern there was that um, a lot, not, uh, many of those reports were happening around our training ranges, were happening around air training ranges. So combat pilots were seeing these things, and, it was, and it, there was a potential impact to the safety of flight of our, our pilots. Um, but you may not have but a fleeting moment. Uh, on some of these things to, to, to see it. Uh, and so it's different. In these cases, um, we had uh, time to detect, time to analyze, time to engage, uh, time to make those kinds of decisions. But it all comes down to safety and security, first and foremost. So is the, the time, though, is a matter of capability? You have better capabilities now than we did back We are then. certainly improving our capabilities now. And, and as I said, the president has directed the national security team uh, to dig into this deeper from an interagency effort and to see what uh, if other uh, improvements uh, might need to make. I mean, look, just just by adapting the way the radar parameters are set, we have improved our ability to detect. And again, I said that could be one reason why we're seeing more. Thank you so much. Um, so you said that the debris fell on frozen waters or in remote areas, and these are also not huge objects, and they were shot down by missiles. So how optimistic are you that uh, you will be able to collect enough debris to really get an idea of what these objects were? We won't know until we get on site to see, um, you know, how much damage was done, not just by uh, the missile strike, but by 
the fall from from a very uh, high altitude, and as you said, in one case on sea ice. Um, so we'll just have to see. Joe. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, John. The Secretary of State Blinken plan to meet with his Chinese counterpart <coughs> this week at the Munich Security Conference. I'm referring to the State Department for the Secretary's schedule. I I don't have visibility on that. Okay. And um, have you been able to? What have you been able to learn more? Uh, or not you, but the government, since these uh, objects were shot down. I mean, you, you just alluded to the fact that, uh, that you've not been able to get on site yet. I mean, has there been any additional information since one was shot down Friday and then over the weekend? Because these are just happened over the last few days and we haven't found the debris, um, there's, uh, there's still a lot more we expect to be able to learn. And, and I think once we can get to the debris, and I'm not forecasting how easy that's going to be. They, they all three have fallen uh, into some pretty remote, uh, difficult areas to reach. But we're going to do everything we can to find them, and that will tell us a lot. Since we have, since, I know you didn't ask about this, but uh, in the case of the Chinese spy balloon, we have been able to recover some debris and some of the electronics uh, and even some of the structure from the bottom of the Atlantic, and that will also tell us a lot, and we are, uh, uh, we're, we're learning from it right now. Wait, 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 no, no, we gotta get everybody, no, no, everybody has to go, Yeah, yeah. Guys, these Chinese spy balloons have been flying over U.S. military installations. When do you think that you'll have all the debris, as much debris as you can get from all the sites? I'm sorry, when do we think When do you think you'll be satisfied that you've gotten as much debris as you can from all the sites? I wish I could give you a date certain on the calendar. I can't do that. We're gonna, we're, we're, we're working to surveil them right now. In fact, you know, there's a, uh, an AVP-3 that's flying over the site in Alaska. The Canadians are in charge, obviously, of the one in the Yukon. Uh, and now the Coast Guard is in Lake Huron working with the uh, uh, Canadian Coast Guard to do the same thing uh, there. So we're working this as hard as we can, and we will keep you informed as we learn more. As I'm doing today, divers in the water over the weekend. We have recovered debris off the coast of, uh, of South Carolina. We'll keep you informed. Will you brief Congress this week? There have been uh, briefings as early as uh, late last week, and we do fully expect that there will be additional briefings this week, perhaps even uh, perhaps even later today. We're running out of time, guys. Just on Beijing's response, they've been very harsh. They said the first balloon was an accident and the last three objects were not theirs. How do you respond to that? Has the White House had conversations with Beijing about this? And can you share a little bit about that? We know the first one was Chinese. They admitted it. They claimed it was a weather balloon. We know it's not. These three, we don't have attribution for right now. We don't know, we don't know who owns them. Um, so I'm not going to take anybody's uh, word at face value here until we can get a chance to, t to take a look at them. Are we in touch with the Chinese? Um, uh, we have, we have a, an embassy in Beijing. Uh, we maintain routine diplomatic conversations. And we have had, uh, in, over that spy balloon incident, we did have uh, private discussions with senior Chinese leaders. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Admiral. I know you just said that are you in touch with the Chinese. Is there any effort to arrange a call with President Xi at all? I'm not aware of any plans for that. If I could just ask a question on Israel. Does the President plan to speak with PM Netanyahu about the moves his government is making to try to weaken the Israel judiciary? I have no calls or conversations to read out, um, uh, 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 but we are deeply concerned by some of the moves here with respect to settlements. The Moldovan president uh, just US. recently has uh, said that there was a Russian plot to sort of overthrow her government and break Moldova's path to uh, Europe. It was something that President Zelensky himself had also warned about. Yeah. Uh, what is the U.S.'s assessment of this possible uh, plot and more broadly uh, what is the concern about Russia's attempts to sort of influence these gov these pro-European governments in the region, even though it's right now focused on Ukraine, about other countries in the region? So um, what I'll say about that is uh, deeply concerning reports, certainly not outside the bounds of Russian behavior. Um, and we absolutely stand with the Moldov Moldovan government and uh, the Moldovan people. We have no confirmation from the U.S. side of intel? I know of no independent confirmation, but we're certainly not uh, questioning the capacity, the will uh, of the uh, of the Russians and Mr. Putin uh, to try to do that. It's perfectly right, a page I write out of his playbook. Yes, uh, 
I was going to ask you a question. <laughs> just, just one quick question. Well, I have to have get you get established whether these are lighter than air or heavier than air? We have not. Okay, but we have to get to everyone, okay? You already had a question. Go ahead. Um, all three shoot downs in the U.S. occurred offshore, but the one in Canada occurred over land. So is it effective U.S. policy to not shoot down these objects over land for safety concerns? I wouldn't read uh, into this uh, some kind of policy decision. We, we will always, in deciding whether something should be taken down or not, consider the impact on the ground. Yeah. When the Chinese uh, balloon came down, the Chinese foreign ministry indicated that they would respond in a way that they were prepared to. If it turns out that the other objects are also Chinese in origin, is, the, is there a menu of options prepared to the president for how we would react? Terrific hypothetical. We're just not there yet. Yeah, so I uh, want like it's a relationship issue. Uh, you have a, the Chinese spy airship that went through. You've got China buying more oil from Russia. You've got China, uh, you know, uh, opening up cases uh, in the U.S. trying to steal U.S. technology from universities. But the Ch President Xi is going to be meeting with the Iranian president. At what point do you re review a big review of the U.S. relationship with China? And at what point does the president ask for a call from President Xi? Again, I don't have a, a call to, to talk about today. Let me just, again, level set here, and I know I'm uh, running close on time, but yeah. uh, sorry. No, it's not here. Uh, but but the, the president met with President Xi at Bali at the G20. The whole purpose of that discussion was to move this relationship forward in a better way. Most consequential bilateral relationship in the world, the president knows that. Uh, and he wanted to move that relationship forward uh, in a better way. And Secretary Blinken was dang near wheels up trying to head to Beijing to have those kinds of conversations, to get some of these uh, communication uh, vehicles and venues back on track, whether it's climate change or military to military. We were willing to do that. We were looking forward to doing that. Um, and then the Chinese decided to fly a surveillance balloon over the continental United States, and it wouldn't be inappropriate to, to have that meeting. When, is, when are those discussions going to get back on the, the counter? I couldn't tell you. Uh, as, you, as Secretary Blinken has said, it'll happen at the, at, the, at the appropriate time. Now is not that time. It doesn't mean, and people shouldn't take away from this, that all communication has been severed between the United States and China, that Beijing and Washington aren't talking. We still have an embassy there. We still have uh, uh, an ability through Secretary Blinken's good offices to communicate with senior uh, Chinese leaders. Uh, unfortunately, the Chinese military is not interested in talking to Secretary, uh, Secretary of Defense Austin, but, uh, but there are still ways to, to communicate. And the president would tell you that now is exactly the time to at least preserve some of those lines of communication so that we can avoid miscalculation. Has it set back the relationship? Well, sorry? Has this all, this list of things, set back the relationship? It has certainly not helped us move forward in the way that we want it to move. All right, last question in the back, and that's going to be the last thank question you. for the briefing. No, sir. No, sir. No, it's right here. James, okay. Me? Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> last Friday, you answered uh, my question about President Biden's message during his trip to Poland, but I'm wondering why he specifically chosen Poland for this trip, since so many countries are helping Ukraine, and he visited Poland uh, 11 months ago. The president's really looking forward to this trip. Um, certainly uh, not lost, I'm sure, on any of you that it's timed around what sadly is going to be a year of war in Ukraine. Um, Poland has been uh, a strident ally, a tremendous supporter uh, of, of Ukraine, um, and a generous host, not only to American troops, but millions of Ukrainian refugees uh, who have fled there in, in safety. Um, the, uh, uh, the Poles are, pardon the pun, but they're punching well above their weight, and, and, uh, and we very much appreciate all the support. The president wants to thank President Duda in person. He wants to thank the Polish people in person. He wants to make broader points about how it's important for the kind of courage and unity we're seeing out of Poland and so many NATO allies continues, uh, sadly, into uh, what will now be uh, a second year of war. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kareen, and uh, thank you, Admiral. Naturally, I have two questions. One on the um, <laughs> unexplained aerial phenomenon, uh, and the second will be on the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, my understanding is that uh, the top officials of the Pentagon, when asked explicitly if uh, they were ruling out any kind of extraterrestrial presence said they weren't ruling anything out. And yet at the beginning of today's briefing, 
albeit with her usual winning smile, uh, Ms. Jean-Pierre <laughs> seemed to rule out any extraterrestrial activity. I don't um, think the American people need to worry about aliens with respect to these craft, period. I don't think there's any more that needs to be said there. On the Russia-Ukraine war, as we approach the anniversary, um, in the days immediately after the commencement of the conflict, we heard from senior U.S. officials such as the CIA director in congressional testimony <coughs> that President Putin had been observed uh, by U.S. officials to have constricted his decision-making circle during the pandemic, that he was making erratic decisions, uh, and these were seen to have played out in, in what happened on the battlefield. As we approach this year anniversary, what do we observe about President Putin's decision-making now, um, the caliber of his decision-making, and also his grip on power in his own country? Has any of that changed over the course of the year? I can't speak to the way Mr. Putin gets advised and how he, you know, who's advising him and, and what they're saying. I, I couldn't begin to get inside uh, Kremlin decision-making processes. Clearly, Mr. Putin is not making good decisions. Shouldn't have invaded in the first place. This is a country that posed no threat to anybody, let alone Russia. Clearly, he hasn't made sound decisions, nor has his military, with respect to their performance on the battlefield. They're still suffering some of the same problems they were a year ago. Logistics, sustainment, integration of joint uh, fires, uh, uh, manpower personnel, uh, unit cohesion. I could go on and on. The Russian military is still struggling. Uh, they, they have not surmounted these, these problems. And it's borne out by the fact that, you know, he continues to change generals the way I change socks. So, I mean, he's, he's still struggling. All right, we have to yeah. Yeah. Sorry, guys, we have to end the briefing. Um, I got to go into the Oval, but um, I will see you tomorrow. And thank you for the compliment on the smile. I appreciate that. But I'll be, we'll, I'll be back tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Have a great one.